begin with, I was born in Utrecht, which is a province in the middle of, of the Netherlands, and the capital city is also called Utrecht. And it started, in the first place, I was born during a heat wave, and both my brother and sister were born during cold weather, and my mother couldn't handle the heat very well. So, I was due around the weekend, and my dad worked at the sports shop where he uh, was a record stringer. He would string re tennis rackets, and the string was catgut, and it had to be with uh, special tightness. He was very good at it. So, on Saturday, my dad decide, decided he didn't want to go to work. So he told his boss that my mother was in labor. Of course, that whole day nothing happened. The next day, nothing. So on Monday, he had to go to work and tell his boss <laughs> nothing yet. Then, in the afternoon, my mother started to have labor and the doctor came at the home. My brother was born two and a half years earlier in a hospital. And the doctor came and was there for a while. And then he asked her, because she was really suffering with the heat and all, he said, you want to get it over with fast? And my mother said, sure. So he stood up and he leaned down and pressed down and I came out. <laughs> and I've, I've never been normal after that. <laughs> it, explains, it explains a lot. <laughs> so then, um, the first, first thing I remember is when I was baptized, I turned four, and that year, the second day of Christmas, because in Holland there are two days of Easter, two days of Pentecost, and two days of Christmas. So on December 26th, I was baptized. I remember the red carpet. And I also remember the water kind of dripping down my face and I was afraid to wipe it off because I thought it was holy water. And um, so that I remember. Then it was during the depression and there was an ad in the paper my parents saw. There was somebody wanted in Zeist, a village not that far from Utrecht who would be a groundskeeper for a tennis park. There were clay courts, something like the infield at, uh, at Deutsche Stadium. So they went and he was hired. Then we moved from Utrecht in two trucks to Zeist. And I remember vividly because we were in the, the, the truck, the first truck, and it had a, a gate like a, that came down. The top was open. And I was sitting on a little chair, and there was a bookcase about that high. My brother parked himself on top of the bookcase and figured out you could rock that thing. And it was marvelous because you went almost over that gate. My parents were in the truck behind it and saw all that with lights flashing and all, they got our truck to stop. And then one of the co-drivers went in and sat with us. So we, mo we moved and the tennis park was in the middle of a forest. And around our area was a chain link fence, so it was quite safe for us to play in. It was marvelous growing up there. And one time, we had found a big pine tree. It, I don't know, it had the branches were coming out and then one branch a little lower was just like an armchair. So we climbed up, used my jump rope to haul up pillows and we were nicely situated when there was a tennis tournament going on at the tennis courts. And my parents were watching when one of the members said, oh, look, there are your kids. <laughs> and my dad started running with my mother behind him because she figured if he starts yelling at them, they'll fall out. So we were summoned to come down. 
And then we were down. My brother got in trouble. My dad was angry. I said, how could you? I was about four and a half. How could you get her up in that tree? He says, well, it was no problem. I let her climb ahead of me, so when she fell, I could catch her. <laughs> uh, we, we couldn't go there anymore. Then, let me, let me check so I don't forget anything. Then, oh, I was not allowed to go to school that first year because I had been sick a couple of times, so the doctor figured it was good for me to stay home. But then, later, I went to first grade, to the village school, and my brother was a couple of years ahead of me. We had school from a quarter till nine, till a quarter till 11, and then we had recess till 11. And the first grade was let out at that time and had to go home. We walked for about half an hour to get to the school. So it was decided I would stay in my brother's classroom until quarter till 12 when everybody else went home. And then we went home for lunch and came back quarter till two until a quarter of four. So I was in my brother's classroom. He got teased quite a bit that, oh, there was his little sister and all that. So he fought quite a bit. <laughs> and then when we uh, would walk home, quite often we would see <laughs> lizards and snakes. And you catch them by putting your jacket over them and then kind of grope under them so you have the body, not the tail. And um, one day, when, a couple of years later, I was walking home and a couple of boys were standing on the sidewalk around something and said, oh girl, stay away because there's a snake. And I looked and knew it was a garter snake. So I stepped in and picked it up and put it in. I had my brother's old jacket inside pocket and they, so when I came home, I was proud as can be because I had a snake. I hauled them out and I had, I had doo doo all over in the pocket. So my mother was not happy. And then another time I was walking, I collected all kinds of stuff in my pockets. I came home and saw a dead mouse and picked that one up because there were, was a factory on the way home that we passed. And the girls were always eating their lunches outside. So I took the mouse and went to one of the girls and I said, oh, your mother gave me something for you. And oh, it was good. <laughs> but when I came home and told my mother about it, after that, she sewed all the pockets in my coat. Shut <laughs> No more pockets. Until I was about 10, I think, I got a real girl's coat. The other ones were mostly like my brothers. And this one had pockets. Well, you couldn't even put a Kleenex in them. They were that small. So it was worthless. <laughs> then also, <laughs> we, my dad one time, the tennis courts were kind of dug out. And there were two on one side, grass, and then two more. And they were kind of deep in the ground. So when the winter came, my dad spent a night watering down the court so there was ice, it would freeze. That's where I learned ice skating, behind the kitchen chair. It was marvelous. But when we got older, in the forest farther down, most of the village people would go there. There were two ponds, big one and then a smaller one, and in between the two was a smaller area with a bridge over it. So the fun was, to speed up on the big one and get enough speed up that you could bend down go under the bridge where the ice was kind of wobbly and go to the big little one. Of course, when Dad found out, we got a season ticket to the ice skating rink, which wasn't half as much fun. <laughs> Let's see where we are. Oh. The, it had a uh, brother and sister, Martha and Edo, 
they were Jewish kids and they lived across the school. Martha was always the last one to run in when the bell rang, they're still chewing her food. They, they were fun. And uh, quite a few of us were invited to their birthday party. And it was great because it was different. In the first place, both father and mother were there and led the games and everything. And instead of cupcakes and all the sweets, we had fruit and nuts. And it was marvelous. And then Martha played the piano, and Edo, the brother, played the violin. And their little brother had a recorder and played. So we had a concert going. The thing is that later, when I started thinking back, there were more plates set than people were there. It was just before the war. And I think people were either afraid or did not like to go to Jewish people. I don't know what was going on, but there were only a handful of us. But it was a marvelous party. Then I have to jump ahead a little. There later, when the war was going on, they were not allowed in school anymore. And after a year or so, they were taken. We saw the house was, was emptied and they never came back. Only a distant aunt survived. But I'm going ahead of time. Then, let's see, hold on. One morning, there was early in the morning, we woke up and there was bombs falling and we heard uh, machine guns. So we all went outside to look. My brother ran to, the, to our tree because he was gonna have a good look. But my dad told him that was stupid because he would be shot out of the tree. And that is where the military airfield that was close to us was under attack by the Germans. And um, it was a lot, it was bad. And then later, our troops went to the area where the fighting was going on. Holland held out for four days, which was more than most others. And we saw we were at the end of our driveway, which was long. We saw our troops go towards what was called the Gremmeberg and where the fighting was. And after a short while, they came back because the Germans had broken through. And what happened in between was that they bombed Rotterdam. Some of the pictures are there. The whole heart of the city was gone. And then they threatened if Holland wouldn't surrender, they would go and bomb the other cities too. So in the meantime, the queen, uh, Wilhelmina, had fled to England and her daughter, with the two daughters, went to and later went to Canada. And the husband, the, uh, Prince Bernard, he went to uh, London and was in the Air Force there. The Queen stayed in London all the time, and some of the ministers. So after we saw our troops come back, then the Germans marched, marched in calling to us that, oh, we had such a beautiful country, and there the pretext was they came because they were going to help us defend ourselves against the English who were going to take our country. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> so, in the beginning, they acted like they were our friends until they found out that the Dutch, most of the Dutch didn't go for it and then things got rougher. So my dad was contacted by a um, naval officer that was a member of our tennis club to join the underground, which he did, because our situation was perfect. We had members of the tennis club coming and going all summer, and in the winter, we had the hockey club, which was, the, their field was close by. So it was perfect. People could come and go, and we could always say they were members of the tennis club. So my dad joined, and they would, <laughs> they would do some things. 
he would he had a small camera and would take pictures. We went to Rotterdam, which had a harbor, and he took pictures of us, but quite often shot past us so that he had the ships in the harbor, and those were developed at home. He would put a red light, a lamp bulb in the light over the stove, and there was a string hanging, and then when the film, the wet film came out, I had to hold it up so he could close pin it on the string, but I wasn't allowed to look at it because if I didn't know what was on it, I couldn't tell either. So it was kind of awkward, but I helped him develop. And that was then sent to England through the underground. But in the earlier days, the Germans had broken the code that the underground used it's called the English Spiel, I believe, and rounded up a lot of the early people, including our naval officer, and they were shot in the dunes. There is a poem about the 18 dead that, that was written after that. And then that came, became more involved with the countrywide one there was the leader of that, we called him Om Hans. He would come once in a while, he would, was hiding in the northern part of Holland, Friesland, where there were a lot of uh, farms. And when he came, that was later years, when there was not that much food anymore, because most of what we had went to Germany. And he would come with a loaf of bread and butter, the farmer's butter, you know, when you spread it, it kind of has water popping out. And he would stand in the kitchen, slice some thin slices of that bread, it was like pumpernickel, and then asked us, my brother and me, what would you like? Would you like one of five cents, 10 cents? Because the ice cream was sold in, it was like a long bar, and then they had a wafer that they put on top, cut it, five cents was small, 10 was more, and then a wafer on the other side. So he did that with the butter. And we'd have a thin slice of bread with a load of butter and a thin slice of bread. We would bite it and see our teeth in it. That was, was amazing. I still have memories of that. <laughs> and so he would come every so often sometimes with a group of others when they had pulled something on the Germans. They would uh, steal some of the ration cards because we, we had everything went on rations. And one time there was a man who came with a whole pack of ration cards and my mother was they had money that the underground gave her to pay for it. And it was nerve-wracking, my mom said, because he sat there counting out the money while my mom was nervous that somebody may have followed him. And then he left, and she took, she waited until I came home with my bike, and then I took it to the mother of the naval officer, because she figured nobody would go there to, to search for it. And um, sometimes Om Hans would come with more people and they would spend the time, the night, in our uh, dressing rooms that were at, connected to the clubhouse and our house. <clears throat> so sometimes he would come and say, remember the guys that we had the last time? Well, they got picked up, they're gone. And then I got a bike when I was 10 years old, second-hand bike. After a while, there were no more tires available because the rubber went for the German army. And we had to, uh, in the beginning also, hand in our radios and guns, whatever. It was funny because the Dutch police collected them and it was close to a, like a, a, slot, a castle which had a moat around it. So after they had collected all those guns, they dumped them in the water, which the Germans weren't happy about. And 
my dad did not hand ours in. He had in the wall behind the door into the living room, he had a hole cut and the radio went in there and a an, uh, paper, newspaper hanger in front of it. So we could still listen to the BBC and cover it up. And the guns were hidden. It was, the building was wood and the double wood and the, in the clubhouse were the, the planks, the slats were straight up and there was one that had a tiny hole in the bottom when you put a nail in it you could lift it and take it out and behind that were, the gun, guns were hidden. And his motorbike, he had a motorbike that was stashed because there was no gasoline anymore. That was stashed in the wood pile, so he had it for after the war. And then, when there was no more rubber available, our uh, bicycle tires we couldn't get anymore. So they used inner tube from the cars, which we had, didn't have anymore, but there were some, some inner tubes. They put that around the tire. And then I was told that that was nice to have. It was a little heavier to pedal. But I was not allowed to have anybody on the back of my bike because that had a seat on the back. Because then the tires would give out earlier. So I, walked, I rode my bike for about 10 minutes where my best friend lived, picked her up, and then she rode my bike and I sat on the back. And that's how we got to school. Well, I didn't have anybody on the back of my bike. I was. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> and after that, we had the heavy uh, water hoses that you used, that we used on the tennis park where the field had to be wet and they taped or uh, stapled those around the wheel. And when that didn't go anymore, we rode on the rims. It was noisy, and you wobbled. And my bike gave out earlier than my brother's. So when we went someplace, I would sit on the back of his bike until we were off our driveway. And then he'd stop and I'd sit on the handlebars, because that divided the weight a lot better and on the front you didn't wobble as bad as on the back so yeah it worked <laughs> i have to check again okay then in 41 my sister was born and um yeah oh, that was funny too because she was born and we were in a room past, uh, there was our living area with two bedrooms. I had one and my parents the other. And then there was the kitchen where my mother served drinks and things to the members of the tennis club, the door, and there was a counter. And then the clubhouse with two dressing rooms and another bedroom where my brother and I were in the beginning. So when she was born, we heard my mother and but then later, when my dad's mother came to visit, it was the seventh day, and she was supposed to stay in bed for two weeks. And there was a nurse lady who came and cooked for us and all that stuff. <laughs> then when my grandmother came, my mother was up. She was not in bed anymore, and my grandmother had a fit. She said, oh, she had to go back to bed because that was dangerous what she did. My mother said, I was up yesterday already. She said, the sixth day is not that bad. The seventh day, that is the bad one. <laughs> so she went back to bed. And then she told us that we had to take care of our mother because the stork had bitten her in her leg. <laughs> we knew. But the funny thing was, I couldn't help myself and look at her leg to see if there was anything <laughs> like that. You never know. So, but then that woman that took care of my sister the first time when we had a big dog, a Bouvier, marvelous dog, who slept under the kitchen table. He was not allowed into the living room. 
because we didn't believe in having his ears and his tail clipped. So if he came in the living room and that tail went, everything off the table went, so he had to stay in the kitchen. Every once in a while he would try and then his front paws would come and by the time his butt was about to come down, my dad would say, bear, and then he'd go back. Anyway, when that lady took my sister to bathe her, <laughs> bear hurt the baby and put his head out. She nearly dropped my sister. So after that, he had to be out. <laughs> so after she left, my mother discovered that she had there was stuff missing, the sheets and towels, and she called the police. And then it turned out that after us, she had gone to the chief of police of Seist, and uh, they missed stuff too. But there was no proof because they had bought their linens and everything. But my mother had made hers. She made the sheets, and they all had the same hem and the same little hem, and on it she had a tape with our name on it that was stitched on. The towels, she had uh, Ada cloth with counted cross stitch, her name on it, because she rented those out to the people of the tennis club. So it was all precise. So when she was, she came before court, my mother went and took a sheet and a towel some of the stuff that she could prove it was ours. <laughs> so in the courtroom, my mother and the defense lawyer were measuring, standing there measuring my mother's sheets against the sheets that she had and against the towels that she had, and it was positive proof that they were my mother's. So then she was going to be convicted and she yelled out, well, don't you remember? You gave them to me when you were listening to the BBC. And that is exactly what the courtroom did because the judge was pro-German and they thought, oh. And the judge said that has nothing to do with it and she was convicted. And it, well, it's, they said in her uh, linen closet, were all kinds of different stuff that she must have done it all over the place. And then when she was in jail, she wrote my mother a soft story that, oh please, couldn't she say that something that she had given it to her because her poor mother was so sorry that she was in jail. Yeah, well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> then the Dutch police came to check and see if he had a radio or guns or something and went through the house and didn't find anything. And when they left, my mother said there was one in the back of the car who kind of went to her. She said he must have been good because um, they were not all bad. And quite a while later, the Gestapo came and we had, before that time, the doctors had to uh, swear an oath of loyalty to Hitler, and the students were rounded up in the colleges because the names were all recorded, and they were sent to Germany to work. And so some of them had gone into the headquarters and looked and stolen some of those lists so they couldn't be picked up. And they had come across a list that had my dad's name on it, and it said nothing definite known, and they told my dad. So when the Gestapo came, my mother knew that they didn't have anything definite. The Dutch police had some, the Gestapo had some, they never put it together. So they searched and they interviewed my mother, questioned her, and I was sent to my bedroom with my little sister, who was about two, two and a half. And that must have looked suspicious because the Gestapo and one of the main traitors of the Dutch came in my room and started looking at things <laughs> and they found 
pieces of linoleum, the stuff that you put on the floor, that was leftovers from what they had before. So I had pieces there, but there was nothing underneath hiding. Then they questioned me and asked if uh, there anybody ever came to our house, I said, sure, members of the tennis club and the hockey club. And if they ever spent the night? Oh yeah. Well, who spent the night? As well, that was my uncle Theo and my uncle Ben and no, that's not what they wanted. Well, nobody else. So they were finally ready to leave and they were taking my dad. They were standing by the kitchen door with my dad. He was pale as a sheet and then we were across and they told my mother to take instructions from my dad on how to run the place and they told my sister and me to say goodbye and my mother held my sister back and said, no, that's not necessary because I know it's a mistake. And when you go and you check out everything, you know it's a mistake, so he will be back within a couple of hours. So no, no, not necessary. And they looked at her and they started talking, talking together. And they said, well, okay, they would leave him and they were going to check up if the story was right and if it wasn't right, his head was gone. So they left, basically, thanks to my mom. But after that, she spent two days in bed with a migraine. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, so that was basically my mom. Then also, my dad had the brilliant idea of making a shelter for if anything else attacks or whatever bombing which was going on, the English came over. And he took bales of hay and stacked those, and that was our shelter. Of course, it worked for shards of gun fire and all that came, but if bombs had fallen close by, <laughs> we would have been buried by the bales of hay. So later, he dug out the shelter. And later, when the bombing started, we could, I remember, we could see the bombs falling, but they went behind us. And um, the Spitfires, my sister, for quite a while after the war, was still terrified when she heard the jets come over, because that was just the sound of the Spitfires when they came down. Then, I have to check so I don't miss any. Then the, the, the last years, there was less food all the time. And we would go in the forest, my brother and I, and we would find mushrooms. It's basically Cantarelle, which sell very expensively now here, and eat those. And we had a book that had different mushrooms in it, and we tried and ate them. My mother got very ill one time of eating them, so my dad wasn't going to touch them anymore. But the doctor said it probably was because there wasn't much food with protein in it, and that was more protein than she was used to, because usually if there was anything, it went to us. So, uh, because later she could eat mushrooms and was okay. But we would sell the, a bucket of mushrooms People bought them from us, and we had rabbits that we ate. And in the beginning, when my dad was cleaning out the rabbit and taking the skin off, my brother prepared the skins, and we had uh, uh, gloves out, made out of mittens made out of them. But Ina, my sister, was not allowed in the kitchen and dad was doing that because it, she played with the rabbits so that would scare her. Until one time she came in and she was totally intrigued by it and was holding one of those eyeballs. And so, yeah, she was, she was even more different than I am. <laughs> so my, I had an uncle 
who worked for the electric company and he had to go to the farmhouses the last two years of the war. Uh, a lot of the electricity was turned off for people because it was more needed by the Germans. So when he came to a farmhouse and didn't turn it off, he would get goodies. When you walked into his living room, you could smell cheese, but you didn't know where it was. Well, he had it under the table. She had, my aunt had cocoa powder, <coughs> milk powder, sugar. So when I was there, when I stayed with my grandmother, I would go there, we had two nephews, and uh, she would give us a cup with some sugar in it and some cocoa powder and some milk powder and then we were to mix it and then she boiled water to put on it. Well, by the time she had the water done, we had eaten what was in the cup already. <laughs> so we got some more. So when I went home, she gave me a tin of uh, milk powder, a big one. I brought it home and my mother said, well, it's yours. You do with it what you want. So after a while, the, there was a family with a newborn baby, and I went there to help the lady in the morning, and there was no milk available most of the time. So I took my milk powder to her, and she was very happy with it. But the next day when I came, she gave me back the milk powder, because her husband had said, not necessary, the Lord will provide. I still get upset when I tell the story. I was fit to be tied because how else can the Lord provide than through people? So I came home and I gave it to my mother. I said, I don't want to see it anymore. So my dad put it in our water with some stuff that we had for breakfast, bit by bit. Then, the landings at Arnhem, you know about those probably. They decided they were going to land at Arnhem. Uh, Arnhem. The fighting was going on already in, uh, after D-Day. It was September and the, it was, they went for quite a ways and they couldn't cross the last bridge, so we had one more winter of war. But when the, those landings first happened, there was close by us a dormitory for students that went to the high school. And that dormitory, of course, had been taken over by the Germans. And my brother and I were walking on that road, and there was no guard. And when we came closer, the doors and the windows were open, no soldiers around. So we figured we'd go and check it out. So we went and nobody there. There was still some stuff on the counters in the kitchen. So we went home and told my mother about it and my dad. And my mother being more of the adventurous one than my dad. She and my brother went back to see what they could haul and uh, because there was food. So they came back, but my dad had the German officer in the kitchen that looked out on the walk past, and he had a tennis racket that had to be repaired. So they were talking about it, and my mother and brother came walking in on that road. Between them, a big table upside down with four chairs on the top, and they one of the was upside down and it had the big eagle on it with F L U V A U the German letters for the Luftwaffe. And they were happy as can be because look what we got. And the officer looked and turned his back to it and never said anything and just let it go by. He was fantastic. So we had that table and the chairs for a very long time and the Germans came back, although the, it was mostly older ones and the very young that had been Hitler Jugend and, um, because all the others were fighting. 
But then it got very rough. That is what is called the hunger winter. We had nothing. At the end, there, my dad would trade some wood for bread, but that had the chaff in it. And then we go and get soup. We go and uh, some days it was brown, some days it was green, and that was the only difference. There was not much in it. But there was one family, a group of families in the area, in our area, that went, you know, people would go across the river and get food, and they would go and get food, and once a week on Fridays, kids under 14 could go with a pan and a spoon and get food there. My brother was too old. He couldn't go. I did. And I went and we had, it was checked, we had to eat everything that was in the pan. So I couldn't take anything back for him. He would wait for me at the end of our driveway and ask what I had had. And I, I felt bad. He said, no, he wanted to know and it was almost as if he could taste what I had eaten. It still shakes me up. But uh, that lasted for a while, that we could do that, and then that didn't happen anymore. So we had less and less food. Then my brother heard that if you went with a pail to one of the schools where also Germans were stationed, then when they had left over, they would give it. So my brother and I went with a pail and waited. And then one German came and uh, told me if I went with him. No, not my brother, just me. So I went. And we went by the windows where all the Germans were all around. And they had like a uh, big tin that the food was in and a little one that they ate off. And whatever was left in the big tin was dumped in my bucket. So I came home. In the first place, my brother was very relieved when he saw me coming back. And then we came at home, and my mother wasn't gonna touch that stuff. But my dad, he boiled it, and it had pieces of meat in it. And it tasted funny, because we weren't used to having meat. It must have been pork. And um, so, yeah, we had some very good stuff, but wasn't, we weren't supposed to do that anymore. We weren't allowed. Back to my paper. Then there were uh, people were rounded up by the Germans to send, be sent men, to be sent to Germany. And um, quite a few of the members of our tennis club and hockey club were rounded up. But they found a way to leave and to escape, and they came to us. So five of them stayed with us in one of the dressing rooms, and one of them had family at the, at the farm, so they had some food, and they had cards. So they lived there for quite a while, and <laughs> I darned their socks, made some extra money. and. Um, then, after a while, they went and left and got to different places. But back to the time of Arnhem. Before that time, there were two Germans, they were Austrians, and they were working at that airfield close by. And they would come and visit every so often and tell what was going on at the airfield. They figured, they laid, one of them later said, they figured that my dad would probably find a way to get it across, which he did. And then when Arnhem happened, the, one of them went, came to us and went, wanted to go into hiding. The other one went back to Vienna and hid there, which was not bright. He was picked up and put in by, uh, in Russia in the fighting between the SS troops. So when he was picked up later when Russia was
free, he was sent to Siberia because they figured he was SS. So my dad later wrote a letter, what he had done before, and he was freed. But the other one, Walter, he stayed with us, and he spoke some Dutch, but you could slice it. it the accent was bad. So whenever there was company coming over, or family, he would sit in my bedroom with a blanket around him, because it was cold, no heat in there. And they, my dad and him had, behind our house, he went out my window, behind the house were little Christmas trees, and they had dug a trench there, so he could go, they practiced, he could go out the window and slide in the trench without the trees messing around, just in case. And uh, later, after the war, he had a Dutch girlfriend, and they married, and he became a Dutch citizen. But he was always talking about the war, and my brother used language that was not kosher. So he was upset with that. My parents were upset with him always having to talk about how the war was going. So my mother had a collection can on the table, and whenever Walter talked about the war, he had to put a dime in. And whenever my brother said the word that wasn't kosher, he had to put the dime in. After the war, we were going to go out to dinner on it. Never happened. <laughs> but when it was safer, he finally went to meet some friends of his girlfriend, where he was supposed to go to begin with, but they chickened out. So he went to meet them. And my brother and I weren't too crazy about him. We played cards and we cheated like crazy. We always beat him because we exchanged cards under the table. So yeah, he wasn't crazy about us either. So we told him, he said, now if you go there and you want to really impress those people, you tell them, so to be true. And that is Dutch for get the heck out of here. So he went and when he came back, they were not happy because he had, with a smile on his face, shaken their hand and said, so to be drop. And oh, 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 yeah, we were bad. <laughs> no, it was so good. <laughs> anyway, after that, uh, it, when it, that was what we later found out, when the landings at Arnhem happened, Om Hans was standing on the side of the road watching those Germans depart. Some chartered uh, baby carriages or whatever to carry their stuff. And he was standing there and then he was surrounded by, there was one guy, Dutchman, who had been chasing him and trying to get him. And he always said there was you always had the chance to escape as long as you saw it. Early days he had been caught and jailed and he had escaped you through a bathroom window with barely clothes on and got into a dead end street and was hidden by an old lady who gave him her uh, late husband's clothes to escape, to walk out with. So he figured at that time that there was a chance to escape and he went and he was shot at the side of the road. Later was remarried in Amsterdam. But then the five guys that stayed with us and Walter, they were gone already. And then all of a sudden there were 21 Germans that came and one officer and 20 men and they took over part of our, the clubhouse and the dressing rooms and my brother's bedroom. They also had the bathrooms because they were in the dressing rooms. So that left us with the bucket. But they um, had anti-aircraft guns, so they took some people from the village who had come and were cutting wood for their stoves because coal was not available anymore. And uh, so we had a forest, so they cut trees. They had them 
cut down the big beech trees and oak trees because they needed clear view for their guns. They stayed with us and we could watch them. There was a knot hole in the wall and they were not getting much either and you could see their faces getting longer. We couldn't listen to the radio anymore because our electricity was shut off too. We had a glass with water with a little bit of oil with a floater in it that we used at night. So their food, what they got, was not much. There was one of the soldiers, when he got his bread, it had a little piece of cheese or sausage on it and some butter. He would give that to my mother for my sister, who was at that time three and a half, four. And he'd say, well, I hope somebody will do that for my kids. So he went without, he ate his bread dry. And then one night, all of a sudden, they were gone. And that was when Germany had surrendered. And he went, my brother had, in German, the book, uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, which had been burned in Germany. So that officer had never read that one. So he swiped it, he took it with him. Well, at least he got to read it. So, let's see, I think, yeah, that's about, that's about all of the time and the war that I can cover. And then we go on to the next round. So, anyone have any questions? Yeah. How old were you? I was almost 10 when the war started, so I remember it very well. And um, my brother was two, three years ahead of me. So towards the, the later part, I was going to, my brother was in high school. The last year, that hunger winter, we had no school because they couldn't heat it, there was no lights and all. So he was more or less given his diploma after the war. He went to some classes that the lady held at her house. And uh, also at the school, we had on Saturday morning after the recess, that last hour, we had religion lessons. And that was general religion lessons. And um, the ones that didn't want that, that was public school. The ones that didn't want it had art or something like that. But we went. And there was for a while, uh, the lady that gave the lessons had something else going in the afternoon. We had Wednesday afternoon was free and Saturday afternoon was free. But I went once, but my dad had to take me there. And uh, he was always the busiest on the weekends because that's when people played tennis and later the hockey club. My brother became, played hockey. We both played tennis. The last years we played on bare feet because you can do that on uh, clay courts. I did it once after here on uh, cement. <laughs> That's another story that comes later. But um, anyway, the, my brother was ahead of me and then when I was 13, I had the choice to go to high school, where, which meant that I went to the seventh grade class with a teacher who was not that nice. He was very sweet and nice. He had a phone in his room. He would be bawling us out and then answer the phone and be sweetness himself. And when he hung up, he kept going where he left off. And he got me one time and accused me of doing something which I hadn't done. And all the rest of the class told him, and he didn't believe it. So uh, I asked to be put back in my own classroom where I was taken out of to put in his to be prepared for high school. And then my mother gave me the choice, either go to that high school or else I'd go to the school for home economics. 
there was another in between high school, but that wasn't wasn't on the book because they figured I would take the high school. Well, I took the home economics and went there anyway. I had a marvelous time there, four years. That's how I know how to how to sew and had childcare and everything else. And it, that was great. So anyway, and when the war was over, I turned 15 that year because it started in 1940 and it ended in, well, it was mostly April, May, 45. But the last year, when um, there was no coal and no heat, people in the city would go and take the railings of their staircases for wood because that last winter was horribly cold. People were dying in the street. And uh, there was, at the last part, the, uh, the railroad workers went on strike because they figured if there were no trains running, the Germans couldn't take more than they had taken already. And a lot of uh, what we called represires, a lot of people were picked up. But then the people went and took those big bars that are under the railroads and cut those up and burned them. And so a lot of stuff was gone when the war was over and we started rebuilding because they had to rebuild more than uh, otherwise would have been done. So yeah, I was 10. And um, so but, but the more you start thinking about it, the more it comes back, like with that birthday party and uh, when the, the family was taken, the Germans were handing out the toys that the kids had and we thought we were horrified that some of the children took them. But on the other hand, maybe they saved them for them. And the thing that kept me going was in my mind, I heard that they were gone and that uh, naval officer. But I always thought, well, everything was after the war. After the war, we would have butter again. My brother and I would take a pound of butter and a big bowl of sugar and take a spoon and put butter and sugar and eat it. By the time we had it again, we never felt it. But that was our goal. And uh, so by, by that time when it happened, I always thought, well, after the war, I would see him again. But by the time the war was over, I was 15 and I knew better. But you cope. Somehow you, you know, you make yourself think differently. I don't know, it may have been me, because my brother's memories are all the dark ones, and I remember the good ones. I remember when we sent the German the wrong way, and oh, we felt so good, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> but then by the time he came back, we weren't there yet. So, uh, yeah, you do things. We had one time also, my brother had a crow, and I was quite tame. He would sit on your shoulder. My sister was terrified of him because he would sit on her head and she hobbled so. But he was out one time with the dog. Whenever he got in trouble with my dad, my mother would send him to the forest. And he was walking and there were Blitzmädel, the women that worked with the Germans in the army, and they had come from where the food was, the dormitory, and were carrying their food, and it had a tomato on the top. And Gerrit saw it and went for it, and everything flew, and the soldiers that were there laughed themselves silly, because it scared the girls crazy. So the next morning, the next day, my mother went with my brother to have a look. Well, then they had it covered, they had learned. So yeah, there were good things. But how do you have Jewish in your life? Oh, you want you want me to tell that story? Okay. <laughs> we came we came we got through the war because we were I'm part Jewish. Because my 
grandfathers, my mother's father, his mother and father lived next to a Jewish butcher. And that was two houses under one roof. And on the Sabbath, my great-grandmother would go on that attic and light their first menorah candle. And somehow or other, there are my grandfather and one of his brothers that are absolutely not my great-grandfathers. They look more <laughs> like Jewish people. And the brothers, I met my grandfather's uh, brother, and he looked like the spitting image of my grandpa, except he had curly hair. And the rest of the brothers and sisters of him were tall, blonde, blue-eyed Dutchmen. So we thought, well, the story was pretty good, you know, that there, those two were the butchers. But later, my sister ben, was married, and she was with her husband in Amsterdam, and she went in a store, and Eric, her husband, was outside, and a friend of his met, met him, and they were talking. And my sister came out of the store, and the friend went, oh, my word. I thought that was my wife. <coughs> he was married to the granddaughter of the Jewish butcher. Mm -hmm. So to us, that's proof. But we were fortunate because it was not legal. So we weren't on the list that we were Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, that is a favorite story. <laughs> yes, the skeleton in the closet. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, I need a break. Permission. Yeah. <laughs> I think she deserves a little break. Don't you? Why don't we all take a little bit of break? Or snacks. Snacks over on the table. Hopefully some of you have some water. Okay. Is it? Yes. Okay. Well, that is the gift I have. Our dad used to call us that way and he went in the forest. And the best part is, my brother cannot do it. <laughs> he, we were in New Zealand, where he lives now, and he asked me to teach him how to do it, and he had spit flying all over the place. He still cannot do it, yay. <laughs> Peggy reminded me of two things I forgot. One is, I had the bedroom later that the high German official was in during the war. And it had, by the door, it had a little hole. And above my bed was my shelves with a curtain and my towel was hanging there with the soap, which later wasn't there anymore. But there was a mouse that somehow would go up by the towel, I think, and nibble on my soap. So, I would go to bed, get an armful of tennis balls, and then turn on the light and start throwing at the hole, because I figured I might hit, may hit him. Never did, but it was worth a try. Then my dad plugged up the hole with glass shards and stuff, so anyway, but I was never afraid of mice. A different story with Lewis and Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the stuff came out for Christmas decorations out of the garage and a little bitty mouse went across and Peggy and Luz were on the back of the seat of the couch and I went for the camera first, I have a beautiful picture, they were not happy. And then in the other story I forgot to tell, where we lived in Zeist there was a patio in front of that clubhouse with uh, woven rattan chairs on the sides with a table so people could sit there. And my brother and I, my mother was cleaning, so there were curtain rods. And there was a tree with red berries, and they were green at that time still. So we stacked those chairs that was only one hole, and on the other one, one hole facing each other. We each got a curtain rod and a load of those green berries and were shooting at each other. You know, you had to aim for that hole. 
Well, first, my mother walked through. She kept walking. Of course, she was perfect target. She kept walking. Then came my dad. He was not walking through. He stood. Stupid mistake. Stood there, telling us to quit. Well, hello. <laughs> and we were making a mess. Well, we would clean it up after. And he kept standing there, getting more and more angry. I knew when to quit. My brother did. <laughs> so my dad hauled the chairs out, and boy, did he get it. He also never knew how to quit in time when we were sitting at the table and we were talking, and dad would say, That's it. No more talk. I know I could say something else. So I'd say something else. And then dad would say, well, the next one that opens his mouth will go in his room and eat. All I had to do was smile. My brother couldn't keep his mouth shut, so he had to go. Anyway, now we go on to the next part. Yeah, <laughs> we were liberated by the Canadians. We had mostly Canadians. My mother did laundry for them. That way she would get soap or cigarettes and for my dad. And um, then I, we had cousins over and my brother and one of them went roaming around and they found an old ammunition dump from the Germans. They came back with bullets, smoke bombs, and all kinds of stuff. My dad at that time, he had in the first place, the, when we were liberated, the hidden bike came out. And he had to walk that motorcycle, you saw the picture in the back wearing a blue overall with an armband that had BS, that was Binnenlands and Strijdkracht, the inland uh, 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 soldiers, somewhere like that. And uh, he had to walk that bike all the way from our place through the village where there still were Germans to get gasoline for it. Then he was a courier for the service later he helped uh, transport people who came out of the camps and then way later from Indonesia. And, uh, so he came back one time in a car, was brought back in a Bedford. And there was a rabbit sitting in those headlights. So he went in, got his rifle, put the bullet in that Ben had given him, and shot at the rabbit and zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
the windows were open and they threw some snow bombs because they figured the class would come out, but uh, the teachers just shut the windows, so it didn't work that well. So, anyway, so we were liberated by the Canadians and uh, it was great. And there was also a, a spot in the kilt and everything. He came walking by and we did the same thing to him and he never blinked. He just kept on walking and it was no fun. We never did it to him anymore either. Okay. Then I was at that school and had practice at uh, kindergarten and at an orphanage. We had was something like the Amish. They, they were called Herrnhuters. They had come from Germany. And it was marvelous people. They had an orphanage there. And at, in uh, Seist, there was a big castle. And then there was the brother area and the sister area. And then at the sister area is where the orphanage was, where I worked in on Saturday mornings. And, um, then a kindergarten later, I worked there. It was fantastic, they marvelous people. The only thing was at Easter, they had the service and all the kids from the kindergarten walked in with candles, burning candles, and that, it, to me it was very scary. But it worked somehow or other. They all wore the caps with the ribbons I know, I think it was a white ribbon, was the single ribbon, but different colors. It was interesting, very interesting. So I worked there, and then there was, my sister went to kindergarten, and a friend of her teacher was having a kindergarten class in what was like an, um, yeah, what do you call it, like the, the block huts and the uh, Boy Scouts used that over the weekends. And then during the week, I, had, I took over for her as a substitute, she broke her leg. And I did that for six weeks. It was great, except there was a potbelly stove. I had to start the stove, there was coal. So I took a rake and took the dead branches off the trees for kindling. And one time on Monday, I started that stove and it was smoking like crazy. There was smoke coming all over the place. I had to open the windows and try to get that out. And I figured there was something wrong, so I checked the flu. That had newspaper stuffed in it. Well, I found out the Boy Scouts had been there over the weekend. Then we had Sinterklaas, which is December the 5th. Sinterklaas is a bishop who rides a white horse across the rooftops with a black helper and they drop toys down the chimney or things. You put your shoe out by the, the chimney or the stove and you sing and then you get whatever in your shoe. One time we were there and dad wasn't there and there came we heard stuff over the roof. There was a flat roof. An absolutely clean white rope comes down with candy on it in the flue next to the pipe. And after a while, Dad came back. Yeah, hello. And the rope was clean after it had been in all those pipes. So we figured that one out. Well, there was, Santa Claus came to the kindergarten there and Santa Claus knew all kinds of stuff about me. I couldn't figure how he knew it. And then I was standing next to his black helper, where you could see the black ending by the white color. And I saw his profile and then it hit. That was the guy that sat in front of me in school. I saw it by his nose. And we teased him something terrible because he was an only kid. His mother had him wear velour pants, and he had to take a pillow to school to sit on 
so the blue or wooded flatten when he sat down. So, of course, he was called Pillow van Overen. And he was a Boy Scout leader, so I figured the newspaper came from him. So, anyway, that was just an afterthought that came in between. <laughs> we also, that just hit me, we also went to a uh, Santa Claus party at the base where my dad was a courier with his motorcycle. And I was called to come by Santa Claus and take off my shoe and I would get candy in it. And wouldn't you know it, I take off my shoe and my big toe was hanging out of my stocking and it was so embarrassing standing there in front of everyone. Yeah, that is another one. Yeah. So, and then, let's see where we are. After a while, we, um, the, the baron that owned the land where the tennis club, the tennis club was leasing it from them, the lease was running out and the son of the baron had inherited it and he wasn't going to renew the lease, so my dad looked for other work and found a place in Amsterdam. So we moved to Amsterdam and there the house was built on the tennis park in the middle of the Fondel Park in the middle of Amsterdam. And my mother stayed home with my sister and I was in some kind of wooden hut that did the serving of the drinks and whatever else that year. And then later worked at a place, an open air kindergarten. There's also a picture of it someplace. And then I tried to get into the teacher's college in Amsterdam. And when I came in, the head lady said, oh, okay, do you have high school? No, I don't have high school, but, oh, well, no, high school can't have you. Then my mother heard of the college in Utrecht where they would take people who had the equivalent of high school, which I did. So I went. In the first place, the lady there was surprised that I didn't have my mother with me. And then I had my uh, report cards from the, I went through the School of Home Economics the first two years. And then there was another year with uh, all high school girls. And then another year of childcare. On that year, interruption, on that year at, uh, the beginning, we had, the first year we had to set the table <coughs> and serve at the table for the teachers who were in the dormitory at the school. And then the second year, we had to cook for them for a week. Well, when it was my turn, I was given something that my mother never made because it was, it looked like watercress, but then you cooked it. And it, my mother said, it's like snow. So she never made it. So I had no clue. So I was given that to cook. So it came in bunches with string around it. I learned at that time, you read through the whole recipe before you do anything. I didn't. It said, wash it. So I took off the string and washed them all. And then it said, cut off the roots. Well, they were all floating there, so I had to fish them out and put all the roots said You should cut the roots first, of course. So, it was terrible, and I was calling. The housekeeper helped me. She felt sorry for me. So I, when I served the dinner or the lunch, I was 15 minutes late, and the head lady was sitting there. You, you're late. Another one said, well, it looks delicious. So, yeah, I learned the hard way. But anyway. That college in Utrecht, they looked at my grades and what I had, and they said it was fine, I was accepted. So I went there for two years, lived with my grandparents, and um, taught school. I think I started there a couple of weeks late, and then was there by October. I was asked by the head lady there to, if I wanted to teach already, and there was a village outside of it where they had the school, 
there was a Christian kindergarten, a Catholic kindergarten, and then the parents had decided they got together and had a public school kindergarten. They, you paid, but they were there because the, the elementary school didn't have a kindergarten. So I taught there for two years, and it was marvelous because there were kids from the doctor, the notary public, a family that had to be fumigated twice a year, all kinds. <laughs> and the best, the best part was we had, there was a piece of land with a pond close by. In the spring, the kids and I could catch frogs, baby frogs, they're yellow, and then let them go again. But it was marvelous, it was a great place. And the Catholic kindergarten and the Christian kindergarten teachers were there too. So we started talking and found out that if parents ran up a bill at, say, the Catholic school, they went to us and started to run up a bill. So we decided from then on, if a new student came, we would check with the other two. If they had to build there, we wouldn't take them. I always said, if we could work together, why couldn't anybody? So I made 60 guilders, 60 guilders a month. And when I had my, my diploma, I went to 90. But it was not enough to go away from my grandparents, where I paid room and board through my parents. They ran up my bill. And uh, it was not enough to rent a place to live by myself. So then again, my mom, she found that in Amsterdam there was an opening at one of the kindergarten schools. So I went and was accepted because at the school in Utrecht, we had art and uh, like modeling, play, <coughs> drawing, painting, and all that. When I had my final there, the final exam, that was in two parts, uh, the written one, and then you had to teach a class. You had to teach, you had to tell a story, teach him a lesson, and do gymnastics that you read up, wrote up yourself. I had from one of the parents, you know those rolls that the cables come on, they're smaller ones. I had, he had given me a whole lot, and I had the gym uh, exercises figured out with those things. So the lady that was the teacher at the college told me to do that for my final, which was dumb. Because, of course, when I started that, those kids had never had those roles, so they had a ball. So the first five minutes, I had to let them go and then went on. So my mother was there and an aunt and I, I figured I had flunked. Well, that part, they said I did the right thing, I let them go, I shouldn't have had it. I didn't tell them that the teacher had told me. I figured they didn't want to get her in trouble too. But then since I picked it up the right way, I passed that one. And um, my parent, my mom and the aunt were watching through the window where the uh, diplomas were given. And there was applause. <laughs> I passed at the top of my class because I had a 10 for drawing and a 9 on the scale of 0 to 10. On, um, uh, for drawing and a 9 for the modeling clay and all that, so yay. <laughs> And then later, I went back, when I went to Amsterdam, in the first place, I moved from $90 a month to 450 a month. I bought clothes, finally. I hadn't been able to do that since the war. Just a little here and there, wore my mother's stuff. So, uh, and there, I went to the college where the lady who had told me, can't have you, she had to take me. So it was very nice, it felt, <laughs> felt great. I went there. But, so I taught there for almost five years. And there was a uh, school that was the first one built for kindergarten. 
We had it for two years. They came when they were four and went to the elementary school next door when they were six. And uh, so the steps on the, it was two story, seven classes, and the railings were low and all of us geared to the smaller kids. And there also, we had Santa Claus come. We rented a horse and my dad came to take a picture. I wanted a picture, that was one of the teachers next door. I was hoping he'd slide down and my dad would take a picture, but that didn't work. He was okay, he rode the horse. Then after that, we moved to Amsterdam and then I went camping the first year after I moved from Utrecht, my grandparents, to uh, Amsterdam. I went camping with a girl I had been teaching with in uh, Utrecht, in the village outside. And I had a small tent, it was for two persons. It had a hole in it, it was my brother's, and uh, he at that time was gone already. He went to college and the mother of one of the guys we had hidden during the war lived in that place where the college was for agricultural one and he had free room and board with her because of hiding her son and uh, he, he was young he was only 17 when he went there and he flunked his first big exam and that was when Holland was fighting in Indonesia because Indonesia was liberated. They were under the Japanese and they was the fight for independence. The Japanese had given a lot of the people who wanted to be independent their guns and the English liberated that area and didn't do that good a job. So my brother was, since he flunked his first big exam, he was, um, he had to be in the service. He became a Marine and was sent to Indonesia. And later from there, when that was, the they got their independence. He went to New Zealand. He didn't come back to Holland because he figured that room, free room and board wouldn't be there anymore. And my parents couldn't afford all that. So he went to New Zealand and he's still living there, married. But we went camping and the tent had a hole in it which was very nicely plugged with chewing gum and it held because we had a lot of rain and you couldn't sit against that tent, it was a low one. So we, we had one of those petroleum whatever things that you, that you could cook on, we had one of those. And we would cook in the morning for the evening, but it smelled so good, we ate it already. And there was a farmhouse close by. We borrowed books when it was close to the beach. It was in the southern part of Holland. You had to go by ferry boat to get there. And uh, when it was all over, I had a little box camera, one of those brownies. And there was one picture left. So we go back on the ferry boat with that one picture left and we wanted a picture of both of us. So there were a couple of guys standing there. She had more guts than I did, so she went and asked if they would take our picture. One of them said, oh yeah, you have to have him because he knows all about cameras. And that was John. And the thing that stood out was, he was, one of the ones that came from Indonesia, they all usually had dark hair, dark eyes. He had blue eyes, which was strange. So he took our picture. I asked the other guys who were in the background, the picture is in one of the albums there, and uh, if he wanted a shot, oh yeah. So John and I stood by the railing. The, uh, the girl that I had camped with got seasick on that ferry boat which was only an inlet of the ocean, and she sat down. So we were talking, and oh God, John was talking about yellow filters and all. I had a brownie for Pete's sake. So it was all oh, very highfalutin. So anyway, 
I started after that when I got back and started teaching again. I wrote with the guy that I had sent the picture with. It was, was marvelous. We had great correspondence going. And then one time he wrote, do you remember the guy that took the picture, who took your picture? Well, did I remember him? So there was from, he was going to the uh, Merchant Marine Academy. He was going for mate, and that was in that area. And there was a big ball in Amsterdam where there was also one of those academies. And he needed somebody to go with. His parents lived in Amsterdam. So I went, and we had a, we had a good time. And uh, he first came, of course, met my parents, and then we went and came back home. And then he started writing, too. But he tried to be funny, and he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd wait for a while, and then I'd write back. And right away, I'd get another letter. So then later, later on, he never could tell a joke decently, either. <laughs> because he, 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 was, he, he tried too hard. So, and then, after a while, I got a card from Genoa. And he was aboard ship, and they were going for a month or two. And, oh, that must be awful, you know, so I wrote him back. Then he started writing about what he saw. And then it was interesting, it was fun. So we started writing more and more. So when he came on furlough, uh, he came over and it was nice. <laughs> and then where we lived, it was a tennis park again, of course, with a clubhouse, with a veranda in the front, with big pillars. And then when you walk past that, there was a, like a, a moat or something all around it. And across of that moat in the park was a bench. And then we had a gate with those iron hoops and sticks. And we had a chain that was looped over it. You could just unloop it. But it looked as if it was locked, so people wouldn't just come waltzing in all the time in the winter time. So my dad, when John was leaving, my dad said, well, you better show him about the chain on the fence in case he ever comes, that he knows it's not locked. So I went and showed him the chain. It took quite a while. We stayed there for quite a bit. <laughs> so when I finally came back in, my dad said, and how many? So what in the world does he want to know? Yeah, we kissed. Yeah. And then I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you were out there long enough to have counted all those hoops there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and then I have to I have to jump ahead because since I'm on the veranda, I, that is the thing that intrigued my dad no end. Years later, when they came to visit us when we were here, he asked me, "Where were you two when you went out with him?" I figured you were at that bench way across. I said, heaven's no. Where were you? I said, I can tell you exactly how it happened. Mama would go and go to bed, and you would be waiting. You went to the kitchen. I could see him through the curtains. You went to the kitchen, had another cup of coffee. Then you looked out the window by the curtain. You turned on the outside light, that was a big bright light. Looked again, sent the dog out. The dog came back to the door. You opened the door, turned off the light, and that's when I came in. He said, so where were you? I said, on the veranda. He said, you weren't, because I didn't see you. I said, there were pillars there. They were big enough. <laughs> yeah, but the dog went out. I said, well, if you sit totally still, the dog gets bored and goes back in. <laughs> so, yeah, that was an, an in-between there. It was, you know, it was great that he had been dying all that time to figure that one out. <laughs> anyway, um, also, in Zeist, there was 
It was a place where a lot of people who were retired, people who had served in Indonesia as governor or whatever, a lot of people. So whenever a new one came, everybody knew. When they came, one of the first things they would say was, yeah, I was champion of East Java. So we knew everyone. So here comes John, one of the first times he came to our house. And he says, yeah, my mother was champion of East Java. And oh, I didn't dare look at my mother because that was the, the famous word everybody always said because nobody could really find out anyway. <laughs> Sorry, Pete. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but you know, my brother-in-law is here too. So, but, um, Anyway, he said that he actually, well, he actually had been in Indonesia under the Japanese. The, they, he had six brothers, and um, they were split. The two youngest, Pete and Jack, were with their mother, and then and one of the other brothers, who was not the next one up, he had had I think he had been sick, he had had measles or something. So he was with the mother. And then the others were split up. Theo, the oldest one, was quite often sick. He was in one place with one old lady. There were two spinsters and uh, teachers colleagues of John's dad. And uh, John and a brother Ben, and then Tony, the younger one, he was about six or seven, I think. They were with one of those ladies who was a holy terror. And uh, Tony later said that quite often when he got in trouble, John took the blame and the beating because she beat them with behind the knee with a little rattan stick. But um, yeah, they spent their time there. And then when they were uh, liberated, then the war for independence started. And that was almost as bad as under the Japanese because John told that at one time they were transported and taken out and then uh, machine guns aimed at them. They were going to shoot them and then they didn't and then they were loaded in again. It was, it was a horrible time. He went through horrible times too. So, but anyway, we had been dating for quite a while. And then we tried to go to New Zealand, where I had a brother living already. And that was no go, because the head of the immigration there, they did not accept people who were born in Asia. So, and that was John. Then we tried Australia, and we got quite a ways. We were on the second interview, and then one of the other brothers, Ben, the next one, he, he went in and tried, and they asked him if eventually, he had his first interview, if eventually he would have his parents come over, and he said, I think so. So, and then both of us were rejected, couldn't go there. And then my mother found out about the Story Walter Act, that was for displaced persons, which John was, and we qualified, and, um, then we came and we flew. In the first place, then we got married. <laughs> John went to his dad and said, I have to, we have to get married. And uh, well, because it was better to be married when you went over than single. And um, we were sponsored by the Catholic Church. And they did not really know very much because the Dutch government paid uh, people who wanted to go and immigrate or emigrate because Holland was rebuilding and in 47 when Indonesia became independent all the people the Dutch were sent out from Indonesia because they didn't want the Dutch there anymore. So here came this influx from more people. Holland was rebuilding. There was no housing available that much. 
the jobs were scarce, and then here came all these people, and they got housing, and they got jobs. And so the Dutch were not happy, a lot of them. I know that at the, when the first ones came, that was before I met John, there were some that came to Zeist. And the boys, it was okay if the boys dated the girl that came from Indonesia, but the Dutch girls shouldn't date with those guys because they were their girls. So, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was weird. There wasn't a special high school that helped them get adjusted because they didn't have school either at the end. So anyway, we came, we flew in to New York. We had booked and were supposed to fly through to San Diego. We were first told we would go to Detroit I bought warm blankets already, and then we got a letter that said, we are very sorry to inform you. You will not go to Detroit, you will go to California. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> John was happy because he did not like Holland. It was too cold. And so then we came to New York, and it turned out we couldn't fly through to uh, San Diego. We went by train. So we went to the train. We bought some oranges, and those trains we didn't have in Holland anymore. Those were the wooden benches. And somehow or other, that's what we were put in. And then we waited all day, because there was a ship coming in, because that was 57, the uprising in Hungary. And a lot of the displaced people from that uprising, from Hungary, came on that ship and came with us. So we were kind of translating for them. And then they came, the train started, and they came around with sandwiches. And when they got to us, there was one sandwich, and he said, well, we'll wait until you have the other ones. They have more. They never came back. There was no more food. There were babies aboard that train. No milk, no nothing. I don't know what they had planned, but that whole trip to Chicago, there was no food, no drinks, no nothing. So when we got to Chicago, we got the dome liner. So we splurged and we had meals in the dining room and all. And so then we came and were picked up by a lady who was the intermediary before the our regular, our sponsor which was the Mission de Alcala in uh, San Diego, Father Booth. So she brought us to a family in San Diego, in uh, well, La Jolla, rich family, big house. We had our own bedroom, living room, bathroom. And we got in, it was in the afternoon. That night I stood and I, I was cooking. I was the cook, cleaning. John had had to get his driver's license passed because he was the chauffeur. He served at the table in one of those nice white jackets. The family would, when there was chicken, they would fight for the legs, and it was, it was very interesting. There was a little boy, he was two and a half, and he had had heart surgery. When he came home from the hospital, there was a nurse that took care of him. The nurse, he was two and a half, the nurse was still there because when the nurse wanted to leave, the lady got an asthma attack and then the nurse would stay again. <laughs> the lady would yell at me to do something and when I started doing it, she would yell and I'd have to do something else. It was not much fun. But, and they were supposed to tell us about social security and everything else, which they never did. And then we brought the kids to school. There were one, two, three more girls. And then we had our day off on Monday. The first Monday that we had off, uh, we left, we got to leave at about 12 o'clock, I think. So the next Monday, we got up at six and left early before breakfast and all that. There were a few other couples that had come from Holland and uh, also were placed with families. 
And so on Monday, we all got together, had a good time. One of them absolutely didn't speak any English. So whenever we went in the store, he just pointed. And then John got a job, the lady that had picked us up. She got him a job at Ryan Aeronautics. And the other one, one of the other ones, got a job at the telephone company, or the electric company, I think. Telephone or electric. So we started on our day off. The family went on vacation, the parents. And uh, we took care of the girls, and the nurse took care of the little boy. And then we could use the car, we were told by the man. And so we went and we found an apartment to rent because there was a black lady doing the laundry and the ironing. When I was there, she didn't do the ironing anymore because I could do it. And she asked us one time, how much do you guys make out here? And we said $25 a week together. I think it was set up for one, but since there were two, they got two for one. And she said, we don't work for that. She told us about the rent, because we were told, oh, the rent you can't afford, you can't do that. And uh, she told us about social security and all kinds of things. She was the most help we had ever had. So we found a place to live, and we took some of our stuff there already, left quite a few of our clothes, because we figured we wait until they have help. When we came back that night from our day off, the closet doors were open, and um, we were met by the lady. The nurse had told them all kinds of things, that we were gone and she had needed help, and we weren't there. That was our day off. So we were told we could leave right then and there. So it was a good thing we had taken our stuff. And um, because we had to go by bus then. Before that time, I had gotten sick and was taken to the doctor who told John that I should rest in the afternoon. I was doing too much. Back in Holland, a couple of years before, I had been on vacation and uh, kitchen help was not very proper. I got hepatitis. That was six, six weeks rest. And so he said I should rest in the afternoon. So when we came back, I told the lady that she went on the phone and called the doctor who was a friend, and she said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So John stood watch in the afternoon so I could have a rest, because otherwise I wouldn't have had it. So anyway, we moved out, and John had told the man that we had insurance when we first came. The government paid some months insurance for us in the beginning. And he said, no, he had insurance for his domestics. So after we were gone about, oh, maybe five months, we got a note from him with a little scrap of paper that said, hey, John, this, you should pay for this or your insurance. And we got a bill for $10 for the doctor's visit I had had. So, yeah, well, I think we had $69 a week, so we had to pay that. So that experience was not very good. So then, there was another group of people coming from Holland, couples, and they were told, because another set of couples had left their family already, and they were told, that, then we were told that they would have to sign that they would stay for half a year and not leave. And we said, that's ridiculous. We get landings money, we got $96 from the Dutch government to help us to begin. So why don't you put them in a hotel and pay, they can pay the rent and find them a job and then they can find a place to live. So they did. One of the couples stayed, the one that had the job at the phone company. And they stayed and their family went on vacation. The whole family, they were house sitting. We went there one time. And uh, they were with us on their day off, because I cooked and the gang ate. And there was a phone call, 
that they could come and pick up their stuff because uh, they were out. And when they came, all their stuff was outside on the patio. He had camera equipment. He asked to go in the room to check that everything was out, and he was not told, no, that couldn't be, because there was a girl in there that they had hired, and she had come all the way from Mexico, and she was asleep, so he couldn't go in there. Hello? We came from across the ocean, and we worked already right away. So yeah, it was weird. So the next couple, the next couples that came and didn't have to sign, he was an engineer. I would have liked to see him do what he did. So he never would have done it. So then we lived there for a while. That other couple, Polly, she came and we went for places for her to find to, for rent. And um, she found a place at the beach, found us a place there. So we moved to Mission Beach, signed the lease, lived there the house behind the house on the beach on the ocean side. Uh, at that time, a one bedroom with one floor above, $65 a month. Wow, it was incredible. You try it now. <laughs> it was fantastic. The floor always crunched because the whole gang would come to us after their work to uh, go in the ocean, take a shower, and then go home. So then John bought hair clippers and uh, I cut his hair for a long time. And um, I finally quit when I was pregnant with Peggy. One of his hairs got in my skin and it was like a sliver. I said, that's enough. But then the friends that were, uh, that he worked at the phone company, they lived close by on the also by the beach, and she was very pregnant, and uh, so was Polly. I lost the first baby. And then we got a phone call that night, could you please come over, it was the, the, the husband, Fred, could you please come over, because he had come home and bought clippers and told Flora, his wife, well, if Grace can do it, you can do it, cut my hair. Well, he had very skimpy, dark hair, so she had started cutting and kind of hit the bump, started laughing, had to go to the bathroom, come back, laugh some more, another bump. <laughs> so by the time we got there, it was terrible. We got dark hair and bump here and bump there, so I did the best I could, short the rest in between a little bit. So then he next day he went to work, <laughs> and the guys there, all the Mexican guys, asked him, "Oh, did your wife cut your hair?" He said, "No, I went to Tijuana." <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it was good. So then we had when we left Holland, we had told the brothers that if we could ever do it, and they wanted to come we would sponsor them because uh, they, they lost their mother during the war and after the war, while after the war, dad was very happy, he worked on the, on the railroad there, what the river Kwai is about. And um, he married, remarried, and then they had a daughter and somehow the, the mother, she changed very much so after she had the baby and she was a terror. So we told the brothers, I won't, I, I'm not going into details, but she was quite bad. And we figured if the brothers came to us, it was better for them and it was better for the baby, for, for the sister. So first came, let's see, my parents came for quite a while too. Then came, uh, first came one, and then came another one, and Pete came. And the last one was Ben. He came when I was almost at Peggy. And that is where we were living at that time. 
at a place rented was next to the friend Polly and her engineer husband. And there was a little, that may have been a converted garage or something, was a little house behind that they rented and they lived there. And when Ben came, he was selected as the cook. He had never cooked before. And although the one, the case, the other one, he had been in the Dutch Navy and had learned cooking and all that, but he was working at the zoo. So Ben cooked and um, one day he came over and he said, what do I do? They're almost coming home and I forgot to get the, the ground meat out of the freezer. I said, oh, you know, you put it in some lukewarm water and it, it'll be okay. So after about an hour, he comes over with a pan with water and all the meat in there floating. He had taken it out of the package. Now what do I do? I said, now you poke soup out of it because there's nothing else. Well, he learned in the long run. So um, there were a lot of layoffs because the, there, there was a layoff and then John would be rehired and then finally in 63, it was really bad because there was a lot of layoffs. We had just bought the house and uh, the job went and then there were apartment houses that had to sign. It started out at $98, then 89, then 79, and 69 a month. And then they had to sign, we give green steps, green, green chip stamps with it. So, we, John went and went to the brother who by that time worked for the LA Times and lived in Burbank and I found a job in Downey Aircraft again. And uh, because the Times didn't hire relatives. So we moved to Bellflower. The house we signed over to the real estate agent. He told us, if you can hold on, it will go up again. Well, we couldn't because we had to pay rent in uh, Bellflower, too. So he took it over. So at least uh, we, we lost some money on it, but at least it didn't go on our credit. So then we went there. And then John, at one point, Luz, Lucy, the oldest one, was going to catechism at uh, Catholic Church. And I was on Saturday mornings. And uh, John dropped her off on Saturday morning. And after about an hour and a half or two hours, he went to pick her up. And she was sitting on the stoop outside. He said, what happened? She said, oh, they canceled the, the class. So she had been sitting there all that time. They never bothered to tell us that it was canceled. They never bothered to call us to tell, to pick her up. And that was, we had already issues. And then that was really the final one. So John started talking at work and then talked to a colleague who was going to Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. And we went there and stayed there. We were very happy there. And then uh, when Peggy went into third grade and Lucy into fifth, they went to school there. And in the meantime, I was teaching, uh, I was Girl Scout leader, had done some babysitting, made some extra money. And um, then we were youth counselors at the church. And then the first grade teacher retired and I was asked to teach there. But some of the parents <laughs> were afraid the kids in my class would catch my accent, although Peg and Luz didn't have it. <laughs> so I went to Long Beach State, and the professor there said, why would they want to change it? It's delightful. I said, I'll tell them. <laughs> they had a great system, though, because I had to read something and uh, on tape and then listen to it and I could hear what I did. Because in Dutch, the last letter at a word, if it's, if it's like a card, here it's voiced. In Dutch it's never voiced, it's card. And uh, a Z at the end of a word is an S. That, that's, 
that's just the way it goes. And then the TH, I have to think before. That was too hard because I never learned the rolling R that the Dutch do. And I had exercises before I started teaching to learn that, to do that. I still have problems with it. So I went there for a while. I had the daughter of the principal and uh, the son of the pastor in my class, and they weren't worried. So I started teaching there, taught there for 18 years. And after a while, John got hired at LA Times when they quit the not hiring of the uh, relatives. He worked there for 14 years and finally had the pension. So I have to check my notes. I don't want to forget something. No, I think I got it. And then one time we went, I went back to Holland the first time in 69 when my dad was very sick and there was a Dutch club at that time. We didn't go there because we had come here, we were Americans by that time. So, but I got a special uh, allowance to go with them on a charter flight to Holland to visit my dad for three weeks. And that was the time of the moon landing. I was at John's parents at the time, and his older brother was there. And Theo and I stood up, stayed up, to watch the moon landing and it was postponed and postponed and postponed and so finally we went to bed and when we finally woke up everybody else had seen it already <laughs> so <laughs> yeah the thing that bothered me was that um, out there they translated everything and the Dutch guy, guy was talking straight through what Walter Cronkite was saying but yeah it was, was, was interesting it was nice so that's the first time I went back and then later, went back, we both went back. In the beginning, it was a no-brainer. I could go back, but that was the down payment for a house. So, you know, I did it. And then my parents came over, and um, my brother one time, and then later again. And then one time when we went back to Holland, John arranged, it was close to our wedding anniversary, that year, I think 25 years or something. He made arrangements. He went with my mother to the travel agent and treated me to a trip to Israel. That was marvelous. It was at the time that there just had been the hijacking of a plane or a boat with uh, Israelis. So we flew El Al because the security was very good. But when we got to the airport, at the El Al station, they asked us if we had where we were going to stay. We said, we don't know. When we get there, we go to a hotel. Oh, if we knew anybody there. No, didn't know anybody. I wasn't going to tell them that I had Jewish blood and how, blood and how I came to it. So it was, that was not kosher. So, uh, no, so we were very suspicious. And uh, that was the time that they would tell you or ask you, did anybody give you anything to take with you or did anybody leave a package for you? Or So we were frisked and then finally were allowed to get aboard. At a marvelous time there, we uh, went on one or two tours, one to go to the inside of uh, Jerusalem and get all the talk and everything. We went to Masada on a tour and to the Jordan and the Dead Sea. The rest we did on our own. We, we took public transportation. And um, we had, the funny thing was, that stood out in my mind, we came on the day before the Sabbath. And we wanted to go someplace, but nothing was running. There was, I saw on the map, there was a biblical zoo close by, so we walked there. People were going in, but when we wanted to go in, we couldn't because they didn't accept money on the Sabbath day. He said, but how do those people get in? Well, they bought their ticket the day before. 
I told you, oh, hey, the Pharisees are still around, right? <laughs> and then in the lobby of the hotel, there were Orthodox Jews walking around, making sure that nobody exchanged money or anything. Well, they were working too. So, uh, yeah, to me, and then Masada was really, and the Jordan, those were the places where everything was the way it was. All the rest, it was nice, it was good to be there and to walk where Jesus had walked, but there were churches built on top of everything, so it wasn't really the way, to, yeah, the Via de la Rosa, that was still the same. But yeah, it was, the people were marvelous being paid at one place where there were soldiers there. We went to the wall, and there, there was uh, there also soldiers with uh, machine guns. But we felt safe. But yeah, it was a marvelous experience. So and then here I was supposed to tell you how I uh, called Peggy and Luz and John for dinner, or if there was a phone call for John. But you heard it already. <laughs> but the camera was. Oh, the camera was on. Okay. <laughs> I should have had some drink first. <laughs> it would have been even better. <laughs> so, any questions? John, oh, about John's experiences, I could tell a lot more. Anything else that I forgot to take it? I think I got it all. Now that the battery is on, on the mic is dead. <laughs> well, <laughs> did you, I, did you, oh, I think Grace I could, no, Grace could make herself heard no matter what. <laughs> we didn't anticipate it going dead, and the other one isn't working. So I don't think we need that that much, could right? You, could you hear me in the back? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah my voice carried. <laughs> That's why I had in Holland before teaching, we had speech lessons. Because in Dutch, you have to, and we learned to let it, Light, because if you scrape your throat with it, you have a sore throat by September. <laughs> and that is the watchword during the war was Scheveningse Schaapscheerder. And that is Scheveningen is a city out by the ocean. Oh, there was one more story. And, uh, <laughs> and okay, so the, 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 the sheep shearer, that is the Schaapscheerder. Uh, there was one more. I went after we were liberated, it was in 45, and in 46 I went camping with an uncle of mine who had a small daughter, and they camped, tent. And then in the evening, she, he and the friend and cup and wives would go out and I would watch the kids. And it was marvelous. But it was a village outside uh, by the beach, close to the, closer to the beach than the village. So one day, my uncle and his friend and I, we went walking. The first place, we went out to a sand, sand bar that was out by the ocean. You could walk there. I had never learned to swim because during the war, when I was old enough, there were soldiers, German soldiers at the swimming pool, so uh-uh. After the war, there were American and Canadian soldiers, so uh-uh, wasn't allowed there. So I never learned. So we walked to the sandbar, and then we went back finally. We had a, we had a ball there. We walked back, and I was walking behind. I was having a marvelous time buoying, you know. And then my uncle looked back, and he said, you don't swim? I said, no. Who? <gasps> Walk with me, because there were hollows. If I had hit the hole, I would have been gone. So we walked by the beach to the other village that was also by the beach. We walked on the wet sand because that's easier walking, but the ocean was just receding. We got to the outskirts of the other village and there's a big sign. We went to the other side of the sign and it said, Beware, minefield. <laughs> we had just come through it <laughs> because we were outside the other village. That side was on the other side, so we had started in the middle. 
Well, we were bare feet. The road was long, black asphalt, was hot. So we figured if we walked on that road, we would never make it on our feet, we would whatever. So we decided we walked back the same way we came. <laughs> because we had come that way, and there was, the water had been there, so whatever was there would probably be visible. But they decided, the two guys decided, they would walk in front of me. They were one, and then the other, and then me. So if one blew up, I would be safe. <laughs> we were singing at the top of our lungs, so we couldn't think. <laughs> and we came back, my aunt was not pleased, because what would she tell my parents? Because, oh boy. Well, we made it. But yeah, that was one more story. You didn't know either. Did that make Oh, no, that was Irma. That was Irma. Yeah, and then we had made a, deal, a spiel of running in the water and running out screaming. And that, Tom Carney was not happy either because we scared Irma for the water too. So, yeah. Now, that I think covers it all.
All right, I see I have all these volunteers that want to close in prayer. Um, so I'm just going to like us. Just thank you, Lord. Thank you for, for everything for today. Thank you for grace. Thank you, Lord, for being through all of those memories. And, and even the life and the times that you brought her and the families for the same thing. We're so grateful to you. Your hand in each one of our lives. We are grateful that you bring us together to a church that we are free to worship you and study the Lord. Lord, we just ask you to be each person's life here and know their needs and know what's going on in their life. We hope each one of them has a need to go with them to go out and to serve you.